Okay, can everyone hear me? Yes, great. Uh, good evening, welcome to the final lecture of the series. Thanks for coming out on a Friday evening. I'm sure you all have more, better things to do, but I appreciate you being here anyhow. Um, uh, just a reminder that the website is up. And I've added some more stuff today. I added some links. I added the slides for the first lecture. I will add the slides for the second two lectures um, and maybe some more links and, and, and things. So have a look. And it's also a place where you can uh, give feedback or ask any questions if you didn't get a chance to ask them. Um, so I'll be checking it. So please, please feel free. Um, uh, right. Uh, I wanted to start with a uh, follow-up with a question that came up yesterday about the, um, it's very small here, about this particular glyph, uh, this one here, which I pointed out is used, used for words relating to both desert but also mountain um, or hill country. And you know, I didn't talk that much about geography since it's just a three lecture course, but it's still a good reminder that geography matters, right? Anytime you study a different country, a different culture, a different language, the geography has a huge impact, right? On how we look at the world, how we talk about the world, how we think about the world. And so I just wanted to give you um, these images to show you then a little bit about the geography of Egypt. You have the Nile Valley, Right, and that's the center of it. And then pretty quickly, you get into you know, and an highly elevated area. It's not super high, right? And it's not like it's not like Table Mountain or something, but it it gets there. And I think you can see it quite more obviously. Looking, this is the area of uh, in Upper Egypt um, around uh, this area, Luxor. Um, those of you who have been to Egypt have no doubt been here and seen this. Uh, this vista of the balloons before, but now you can kind of see why it is the hill country is associated with desert, right? It's very stark why those would be kind of one and the same from the perspective of the Egyptians. Um, so anyways, I just wanted to show you that and just as a reminder about the kind of importance of thinking about geography when we're thinking about foreign places and their languages um, and how that matters. So uh, today what I wanted to do then is talk a bit about where writing comes from, the different stages of Egyptian writing, and then give you a bunch of examples of how Egyptian writing was used. Wow, that image is really dark. Okay, sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, give you some examples of how the language is used, and there will be a lot more pictures today uh, than there were yesterday. I should say pictures of hieroglyphs, pretty pictures. So uh, if you found yesterday's lecture a little too technical, this one will be uh, much more pleasing uh, to the eye, I promise. So um, Egypt, Egyptian is one, is now considered kind of one of the four early pristine writing systems that we know of. Uh, there are probably others. Um, there may be one from the Indus Valley, but it's not been deciphered yet. Uh, but we know kind of four right now, and they developed in Mesopotamia, in Egypt, in China, and in Mesoamerica. Uh, now, it was once thought that uh, the Egyptian writing system was you know, influenced by or somehow came about as a result of contact with Mesopotamia or came about as a result of, of knowledge of proto-cuneiform. But this, the general consensus now is that it's probably not the case, that the Egyptian probably emerged, Egyptian writing emerged organically uh, within the Nile Valley itself. And the reason for this, um, there's a couple. Um, one is that Egyptian, early Egyptian hieroglyphs don't look anything like proto-cuneiform glyphs at all. Um, the function seems to be a little bit different uh, early on. And then also you can see, a, you could draw a clear connection between early hieroglyphs and then the iconographic tradition that we find in the Nile Valley in the prehistoric period. And I'm glad I put the drawing up because the picture is really dark. It's hard to take pictures of rock carvings. Um, so, but on the left are just some examples of early rock carvings, uh, in, especially in the desert areas around the Nile Valley. And they can be tied iconographically later on to hieroglyphs. So if you're wondering where, where does it come from, now it's a general kind of common thing, uh, theme that these early writing systems all, of course, came from pictures originally. Because remember, they're all 
logo graphic systems, right, as I talked about yesterday. So um, what about these, these tags? So as I, I showed you these tags the first day, uh, they were found in a tomb. They're made out of bone or ivory. Uh, they have little holes in them. The holes are not part of the glyph. The holes are for tying them uh, to objects. They were tied to jars and, and other such objects. And they were found in a tomb of an early ruler of Egypt, probably before Egypt was united, but one of the regional rulers. Um, but he was buried in a cemetery that was later used for the first kings. And you can kind of see how as time went on, the tombs got bigger and bigger uh, for the first kings. But his tomb, whatever his name was, we don't know, uh, is up there. And so these, um, and the, uh, a whole bunch of these tags were found on it, and they seem to have uh, what are early hieroglyphs. Now, why are, they, why are they writing? Why are we calling them early writing and not just symbols? Um, I should say they represent names, right? Names of places. Um, some of them clearly indicate numbers, right? With these marks. So why are they writing? Why aren't they just symbols? Well, because um, some of them clearly are combining different symbols together to, um, and we think that they must be describing actual vocalized words because they resemble later hieroglyphs. So for example, we've got one here that's an elephant over a hieroglyph that should now be somewhat familiar to you, right? It looks like the hill one I just showed you. So that, this is 3,300 BC or there is a, thereabout. Um, the date is very approximate. Um, skip forward to Middle Egyptian, and from a, this is just taken from a Middle Egyptian dictionary. Spelling has changed a bit, but here you've got the elephant hieroglyph again. And it's Abu, that's how we're going to vocalize it, elephant. Uh, it's also used in some spellings for the city, the site known as Elephantine. Right? We can see the connection in English. The name Elephantine itself, that spelling in, in English, comes from the Greek. Right? So the Greeks obviously translated the Egyptian word Abu into elephants. Or it was told Abu means elephant, so they called it O, oh, the Elephantine city, Elephantine. Um, and so you can see you've got the the elephant there and the um, hill country determinative. Uh, so even though by the Middle Kingdom now it's being spelled a bit different, we can still see that connection. And the, the point of this is that what's going on here is that this seems to be not strictly pictographic, right? They're using the rebus principle that I mentioned, mentioned yesterday, using the symbol for elephant to stand in for the word abu. At least that's the theory. Um, that's how they're going. But um, it's best then to consider these as a type of proto-writing, right? There's no sentences yet, there's no phrases, there's no grammatical structure at this point. Um, that's going to come a bit later. In fact, it takes about 500 years until we see a fully developed, full-blown writing system with grammar and sentences and all of that. Uh, I mean, at least how we see it in the record. But it, that could change at any time with new discoveries, right? Um, there's a lot that's, um, that's missing, and we have to assume that a lot of early writing was done on perishable materials, and that's why it doesn't survive. So um, and one other question we can ask of these tags is, what it can, is there anything they can tell us about why writing um, developed? Um, which is, you know, again, a common question amongst linguists and anthropologists. And most people think that, at least in Mesopotamia, writing developed because of, out of a need of bureaucracy, right? The, um, compl the complex city-state, uh, um, increasingly complex economy demanded some sort of record keeping uh, in, in, in order to keep things humming. And that certainly seems to be the case in Mesopotamia. And it's probably part of the motivation in Egypt, too. We can see some of the tags have the numbers on them. They're probably about you know, having to do with amounts. But also, these tags, um, what we know about these specific tags is that they were all made at the same time. And they were deposited in a tomb, right, and sealed. So these tags weren't meant for everyday use. And how do we know they were made at the same time? Because whoever made them was a little sloppy in how they cut them. And so we can see where the cut marks are, and sometimes the cut marks cut in the middle or the edge of a symbol. Um, and so you can put them back together. Um, and also, the carvings have been filled in with some sort of black material. They've been colored in specifically. In other words, someone went to a lot of effort to make these um, tags and then just to put them in a tomb. 
So there's some sort of ceremonial aspect going on here also. Something about elite display, elite control, um, and so on. So we should also just think about that there is other ideological re um, reasons for developing a writing system besides simply record keeping, because there are lots of complex societies uh, in history that didn't use writing, and they were still, you know, they still had complex societies and economies and so forth. Um, so it's just it's something to think about. Right. Um, okay. So, but when do we get to the real writing, <laughs> the interesting stuff? Um, like I said, there, there's some stuff in between, but I'm going to skip over it uh, to when we get start to get actual sentences. Uh, and that doesn't happen for a few hundred years, at least in our current evidence. Um, we, the first sentence that appears in our current evidence comes around 2700 BC in Dynasty II uh, in the form of a ceiling, um, like a cylinder seal. You, you would roll it on clay or something, right, to make your mark. Uh, and we get um, our first conjugated verb, uh, very exciting, and our first, first sentence, right? So. Uh, you know, from yesterday, I tried to add some more words here to hopefully help make sense of it more than yesterday's slides. I don't know if it helps or not. But um, this first reading, remember from, um, so these are actually kind of in short columns, but we, and the birds are all facing, the birds facing this way, right? So we're going to go this way, um, left to right, up to down. So um, this word is unite. This symbol is actually a suffix for a conjugated verb, um, it indicates completed action. Uh, this is also a suffix for the pronoun. Uh, so this says, he united. Uh, quite simple. So this uh, two symbols uh, together mean the two lands, and it's a frequent euphemism for Egypt as a whole, united Egypt, uh, upper Egypt, lower Egypt. Uh, it's referred to frequently as the two lands. Um, and the idea of the, uniting the two lands is a big, becomes a very big part of the ideology of the king of Egypt. So that's what this is all about. So united two lands. Um, here's the same symbol. It can be a suffix. It can also be a preposition uh, for the word two or four. Uh, for those of you who are into languages, it's, it's to indicate the dative case, if that makes any sense to anyone. Um, so four, and then we have this glyph, which is a word for sun. Um, again, the suffix, the serpent suffix can be a pronoun he. It can also be a possessive pronoun, his. Um, so we've got united, two lands, uh, for his son. Um, we don't seem to have a clear subject. Um, well, actually, it's, well, it's complicated, but you have to take my word for it. The subject is just going to be he. So he united the two lands for his son. Um, the king of Upper and Lower Egypt, Per Ibsen. Um, so I think there, there's two ways you can take it. You can either take the king of Upper and Lower Egypt, Per Ibsen, as a subject, or as, um, what's the word I'm looking for? As the, oh, the not object, but um, uh, as his son. So the, um, you set it off with commas. What's, see, now the English is failing me. A word you would set off in commas that you don't need grammatically. What's the word? A positive, sorry. Like a parenthetical, right? Um, so mod either clarifying that the son is per Ibsen or it could also be the subject, right? Um, it's very simplified. There's not um, some signs we expect are missing, but it's also on a very small ceremonial object. So that's why unnecessary signs have been, or you know, superfluous signs perhaps have been left out. Um, anyways, that is the first sentence that we have. What about going beyond sentences? We have a couple of things, um, but it's not until about 2600 in the fourth dynasty. So our first monumental long inscription comes from a tomb of a guy named Metchen. Uh, he was a scribe who rose in ranks to be one of the top scribes of the court uh, and a close advisor of the king, or at least so we're told, that's what he says, um, and a close advisor to the king and also mayor or over, you know, administrator of a, a few cities and regions. Uh, he says that he was given many estates by the crown for his service, including one which he turned into a wine farm, uh, as well as orchards, and, um, and all in all, a successful guy. And so it's, 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 full in, it's fully in prose, full grammar um, and everything. And 
It's the first of a whole series of texts that we get called tomb biographies. They become very common amongst the elite in the Old Kingdom, and they continue on um, afterwards as well. Uh, but there's one other thing, too. Oh, sorry, one more comment I want to make. Um, the, it's hard to see in this photograph, but at this point, the orthography, like, I should say like the, the shape, the typography, if you will, of the shapes is pretty much set. Uh, so even though we don't have a lot of like extensive writing examples before this time, the shape that the hieroglyphs take, the style, the artistic style of them, it's basically set, uh, as is the repertoire of signs. I mean, it's gonna, there's going to be more, there's going to be some added, subtracted, and so forth, but it's pretty well established now, um, which is what part, of, part of what makes Egyptian so distinctive when you see it, um, no matter what period. Uh, someone asked about the oldest papyrus that we have, and I didn't have the answer to that, um, but uh, looking up, thank God for the internet, right? Uh, actually, uh, just a few years ago, there was an, a, a pretty impressive discovery made, a whole cache of fragments of papyri from a cave on a port on the Red Sea, and they're all part of a logbook of, uh, of a supervisor, if you will. I think he's referred to by Egyptologist is inspector, but basically a supervisor. A supervisor of workers working for, uh, working on King Khufu's pyramid, the big one, the big pyramid, the Great Pyramid. And it's a log book and it talks all about provisioning and procuring supplies. Um, so it's, quite, it's been quite interesting for those who are trying to reconstruct what's going on with how the pyramids were built and the processes of labor and supplies um, and um, the, uh, the, you know, the chain of supply, that's what I'm trying to say, the supply chain. Um, and this one, now hopefully you can detect, as opposed to the other one, this one's written in hieratic, right? So hieratic is also completely developed by this time. Um, there's some evidence, small evidence, that it's, it's around well before this. So they've, they've already developed a complete writing system for all kinds of administrative um, tasks. Um, Okay, so uh, before though I go to go talk about more examples of writings and different genres and texts, uh, let's just review a bit the different stages of the language. I mentioned this a bit the first day, and don't confuse the stages with the different scripts. It's easy to confuse them because some of the scripts and stages have the same name, uh, but the stages are slightly different. Um, now, Egyptian was a, a language that lasted many, many millennia, as we saw on the first day. Uh, so, of course, it changed significantly over that time, right, in terms of vocabulary, phonology, morphology, syntax, all of that. Um, it's challenging, though, to track the changes because of the lack of vowels, the, the lack of emphasis on vowels. So it's made it difficult for Egyptologists to kind of figure out you know, what's been going on. Um, that said, Egyptologists now generally identify five major phases of the language. Um, and within these phases or stages, though, there's a whole bunch of sub-stages, uh, which I'm not going to talk about except for Middle Egyptian. Um, but roughly speaking, Old Egyptian, and I should say, this is just for the written language, what I put on the slide. I'll talk about speaking in a moment, but this is just in terms of what we can deduce from the written texts about the written language. Um, so we have the old Egyptian you know, dialect, but I, I use that word um, hesitantly, dialect, it, which is, goes until about 2000. Um, I didn't want to make the slides too crowded, but if you're wondering, that's through the end of the first intermediate period. Um, around there. Then Middle Egyptian from around 2000 onwards. And of course these, these borders are not firm, right? There's overlap and the latest stage of Old Egyptian is starting to have elements of the early part of Middle Egyptian and so on. Um, and so Middle Egyptian comes in basically with uh, the, um, the uh, Middle Kingdom period, um, you know, with reunifi reunification and all of that. And 
it's, we can divide it into kind of three sub-phases, if you will. The first is classical Middle Egyptian, and that is the language, that's the written language of the Middle Kingdom. It's the written language of Middle Kingdom literature, so if you're familiar with any Middle, um, Egyptian literature, like how many of you have heard of the tale of Sinue? A few of you. That's in Middle Egyptian. Um, a lot of the, what's considered the classic Egyptian literature is in Middle Egyptian. Um, this is literature that lasts from, um, that's read and rewrite for millennia um, by Egyptians themselves. Uh, then, uh, in the second intermediate period or thereabouts, we start to get um, a shift in, in, the, in the writing, and, it's, and we get what they call late Middle Egyptian. We see, start to see a shift in some forms. Um, and it's used until through the early New Kingdom in writing, uh, through the 18th dynasty, most of the 18th dynasty. And then, Around 1350, there's a somewhat, I mean, a fairly obvious change in the written material, and there's a shift to late Egyptian, what we call late Egyptian. And it happens around the time of the you know, rogue pharaoh Akhenaten, right? About in the Amarna period, around that time. How many of you are familiar with Akhenaten? Quite most people. Okay. So, is, you know, if, and if you don't, basically in the New Kingdom, there's this time of quite radical cultural and religious change, or I should say more of an interlude, uh, with Akhenaten when he basically abolished the official state cults and introduced a single god, um, the Aten, the sun disk, who was only really knowable to man via Akhenaten himself. <laughs> it's convenient, right, for him. And, uh, and that wasn't the only reform that he um, introduced. And, and this is a time of great prosperity for Egypt, and it was had a big empire and, and all of these things. Um, Akhenaten's uh, religious reforms didn't last much beyond his lifetime, uh, and the original state cults came back, but there were some other kind of long-lasting changes, and it seems one of them was changing um, the written language, presumably to a dialect that is more in line with what was actually being spoken at the time. So, so you get this break between Middle Egyptian and Late Egyptian, but that doesn't mean it's the end of the Middle Egyptian phase. So let me jump back up to this line. Um, there is a, a, a version of Middle Egyptian that persists, which scholars call traditional Middle Egyptian, which is like the previous language, um, but it's used now only for certain genres of writing, uh, religious texts mostly, um, monumental texts, um, and uh, it's, like I said, it's, it's like classical Egypt, Egyptian uh, and late Middle Egyptian, but it gets influenced, of course, by what's happening in the current language. So again, the best parallel, I mentioned this parallel before, I'll mention it again, is, is with Arabic. So you think of classical Middle Egyptian as the Arabic of the Quran, right? Classical Arabic. Uh, and then you think of then traditional Middle Egyptian is, is modern standard Arabic, right? which is um, you know, based on the classical but modernized. Uh, and so then uh, late Egyptian then would be like a dialect of one of the contemporary, like you know, Egyptian Arabic, perhaps. Um, uh, but that's, I mean, but it's not a perfect analogy because late, late Egyptian was used for a lot of official correspondence and stuff like that. So, um, so late Egyptian comes in as a dialect, uh, and then eventually then we have what we call demotic, uh, which is just, a, you know, it's in a new evolution of late Egyptian, and then after that Coptic. And I'm not gonna talk about them very much more because I'm not gonna show you any more examples of them. Um, and they, have, of course, are written in the scripts that you've already met. Um, Right. Um, so one, uh, one more comment I should make about traditional Middle Egyptian. If you, if you see hieroglyphs that are new, you know, late New Kingdom or later, they're probably in traditional Middle Egyptian. That's the language of the hieroglyphs on the Rosetta Stone. So like Middle Egyptian, but maybe with some slight differences. What about the spoken language? It's really, really difficult to know how the written language relates to the spoken language in any period. Um, but we have hints of it in dialogues. So the, we have tales, written tales, um, both in, uh, in the Middle Kingdom and in, in the New Kingdom, in Middle Egyptian, and also some stuff in Late Egyptian, um, but a lot of stuff that's in, mostly in Middle Egyptian. But what's interesting is that when they, 
write the dialogue of characters, they seem to use the current colloquial spoken language. Or you can see the difference immediately. So that's the assumption. Uh, so we get some hints about what's going on. And it seems that from a variety of different evidence put together by uh, the specialists, that already in the Old Kingdom, during, you know, there's a divergence between written Old Egyptian and what's spoken. Uh, it seems to be happening very early on. But there's just, we, there's not, there's just very little that, that we can do to figure out kind of how it works. What about regional dialects? Egypt's a big place, right? Uh, so is there evidence of regional dialects? And there is. There's anecdotal evidence in comments by Egyptians themselves who make comments about how the, ma the, you know, the speech of a man from Elephantine, which is in the south, is totally incomprehensible compared to the speech of a Delta man, you know, someone from the north. Uh, so there's that. Um, and there's other suggestions that there is, of course, um, regional, dia um, regional dialects, which we should expect. Um, and of course, Coptic gives us clues also, um, because since Coptic has vowels and we can see the differences more clearly, just from written Coptic alone, we can already see many different dialects. Um, can we connect the written language to any particular dialect? The answer is maybe. <laughs> um, it's thought right now, actually, that um, Old Egyptian and Late Egyptian uh, both originate from a similar dialect that's probably from the north. And Middle Egyptian is a separate dialect that originated in the south. And so in some ways, middle, written Middle Egyptian kind of interrupts um, Old to Late Egyptian. And this would have been probably for political reasons. You have di rival dynasties from different area regions and other power players, but it, it seems that there is that difference, just if, if, in case you're curious. But there's still a lot of work to be done um, in that area. Okay, so let's, let's look at some texts and genres. Are there any questions about any of that? Now, from now, it's just going to be really fun, <laughs> Less, depending on your definition of fun. Yeah. Not yet, but look at China. I mean, surely we assume that China will eventually surpass um, Egyptian because China, China is now 3,500 years old. The Earth might explode in a hundred years' well, time. Well, I try to be optimistic, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, but also, but not just yeah. Um, also, then I mean, Greek is a lot newer, but I mean, not that much newer. So Greek, if you go all the way back to and count linear B and all of that, Greek is also um, a competitor. But Egyptian is still the longest because um, Coptic. If you consider that Coptic was still being used until the 11th century AD, spoken, and then even as a dead language, you know, until the 18th century, it's quite long. Mm -hmm. Question? Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, I say I say bird because that's the most common. But yeah, basically all the heads of all the animals of the people. Um, I say yeah, birds because birds are usually the easiest to spot because they tend to be bigger than other ones. But also the people, the snakes, the bee. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Except when they don't. No. <laughs> there are a few exam There are a few cases, but yes, for the most part. <laughs> yeah. And do they have a, a date system in how that they write it? Oh, they did. Oh, they do. Um, yeah, I didn't include it. They do, and it involves using the symbol um, for the the year, the regnal year. Um, there's a symbol for year, and then you have a number uh, of what year it is of the king's reign. And then you've got the month sign, and there's three different months. There's, um, you know, the equivalents aren't quite right, but basically there's flood, um, there's sowing, and there's harvest. <laughs> That's how they uh, did it. So there's one of those three months. Sorry, not three months. I'm sorry, I said months. I meant season, right? Season. Um, and then each season has four months, and there's a name for each of the months. Uh, so they do it like that. They do year, season, month, day. And each one, each symbol for each of those followed by the numbers. So it's pretty, it's actually quite straightforward. Well, it only to that current king's yes. brain. It didn't go back to mm -mm. 
No, there's no no absolute start date, just to the current king's reign. Uh, so his you know so his name will usually be there too, because he's the king, right? So ha you have to name him. Uh, was there any authority which would rule upon whether something was correct, ancient or not? Probably the temples, but is it centralized? That's not clear at all. Um, the temples and then the court. It depends, because at some, po some point the court is strong, right, when this country's unified, but there's periods when the country's not unified. There's periods when the priests are kind of stronger than the king. Um, so, yeah, in theory, there's, defin there's definitely control, but exactly who it is. Is there an independent institution? No, there's no, like, independent dictionary authority or something. Um, not that we know of. Um, hmm. I don't know, is there an authority today? I'm trying to think, over English? In French, there is, right? <laughs> in English, I think it might be a bit of a lost cause, right? In, in, it's so global now. It's everyone's language. Um, OK, so let's talk about some uh, genres and texts. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about some that are probably familiar to some of you, some that may not at all. Um, and one of the great things about Egypt and, it's in, you know, the fa and, and the fact that, first of all, they seem to write everything down, um, and second, that the conditions are so good for survival, is that we really get insights into ancient Egypt in a way we don't for, say, the ancient Greeks or the ancient Romans or some other people. Um, uh, you know, we, get, we have a bit more, uh, greater variety of textual testimony. So um, one early way that hieroglyphs become very prominent is in the so-called pyramid texts. Uh, so-called because, well, they appear in pyramids, so that's why we call them that. Uh, they appear in the uh, burial chambers of the pyramids of the um, Old Kingdom. Um, not the great ones. Uh, that's Dynasty IV. It's more characteristic of Dynasty V. Um, so uh, when they're starting to get smaller and they focus on different aspects of the whole burial complex. So in the burial chamber, there would be a series of spells, basically. And what they are, they're spells to help for the transfiguration of the king's soul to the afterlife. Um, and they're you know, mag magical utterances to protect him, to you know, be recited at the royal funeral, uh, instructions about how to deal with uh, uh, offerings and how to reanimate them in the afterlife, uh, things like that. Uh, it's stuff that they need to make it to the next world. Um, let's put it that way. And, uh, you know, these were carved in columns, and you can see that here, um, which direction should we read from? It's a quiz. Right to left, yes. And up to down. Up to down, yes. Definitely up to down. Um, so, we was, so which corner would I start in? Yes, great. And then that way. Mm -hmm. uh, so, right. So in, but in the Old Kingdom, these kind of texts are reserved basically for the kings. Um, that changes as time goes on, and these kind of rituals for going to the afterlife become a bit more democratized, and then we, we find them on the funerary equipment of private individuals, too, uh, especially coffins. And um, this is one of the, if not the nicest coffins discovered from the Middle Kingdom period, uh, 11, Dynasty 11 or Dynasty 12. It's in the Boston uh, Museum of Fine Arts. And it was a coffin for a governor, I use that term loosely, some sort of administrator of a region within Egypt, uh, Governor Juti Nacht. And it uh, depicts, well, what are we looking at? It's a little bit, I'm going to turn the lights off just for a second um, so we can see a little better. It is better now, yeah? Sorry, I just don't like forcing people into the dark. But now you can see. Um, this part here is the false door, right? So this is where the, uh, the soul of the deceased could come and go from the afterlife into back into this life, because they can do that. Um, and then here is uh, the deceased receiving all his fabulous offerings. He needs these, of course, to sustain himself in the afterlife, because you need to eat in the afterlife too. Um, so it's best to guarantee that food um, here. Uh, you can do that both with actual offerings, assuming your family is going to continue to bring you offerings. But if you don't trust your family to do that after you're dead, you can do it visually and with spells to animate them, which is what most people did, right? Uh, at least those people who could afford to. So here are all his great offerings. 
Up there we have some lines of hieroglyphs. There are um, a prayer to the king and to, uh, I think Osiris, to, it looks like, uh, to um, provide him with offerings in the afterlife. Uh, on the right, with all these, these figures and these, um, there's like a hieroglyphs really small right above each one. This is a wish list of all the things he would like the king and Osiris to give him in the afterlife. Uh, you got to write it down or, you know, it's not going to happen. Um, and then here, these just look like lines, but this is a detail of this. Um, and these are the so-called coffin texts, which are basically a continue or a new version, a slightly modified version of the pyramid text, but now for broader consumption. Again, there's spells, rituals, instructions for the successful transfiguration of the soul into the afterlife. Um, and they've been carved here, and this is wood, right? Carved into tiny little hieroglyphs um, that are only at, like about this wide. They're quite, it's quite small. Um, and I just wanted to show you a couple of details. I guess I should have talked about this part with this slide. Um, anyways, now you can see better uh, and how much effort went into and how brightly colored and um, detailed it is. And I even have a close-up of those hieroglyphs up there. Um, this is one of the more elaborate examples of how hieroglyphs could be painted. Uh, they often were not for obvious reasons, but here um, uh, they were. And it's quite, um, it's quite lovely, especially because you have like, you know, shading and depth uh, in especially the birds and, um, and quite a lot of detail. So that's quite nice. So if you're ever in Boston, go to the Museum of Fine Arts and go check out um, this coffin, because what they did is they dismantled it and just put all the parts of it on a wall so you can get really close to it, which is why I could get these close-up photos. Um, okay. They are. So the, oh, this is a um, uniliteral sign. That's why it's pretty common. Uh, and it's, I don't know, gosh, what is it doing in this context? Pen? Um, it's probably a preposition for in or on. Um, and then, but there, there's a ton of different birds. If you go and download the sign list uh, that I posted, I posted a link to it on the website. Um, Alan Gardner lists all the birds and identifies them all to the extent that he, that they have been able to. Um, but there's, you know, quail chicks, there's wrens, there's a, uh, there's a falcon. Um, they're all parts of words. Which one? It's, oh, right. Um, gosh, what is that meant to be? And what about the black thing that looks like? Oh, this is that if we've seen before, right? It's, vocal, it's a unilateral vocalized as N, right? It can be, so this, it's a little weird, but this is the word for, this is a letter for P and N, and it's usually, um, often it means this. Um, you can see it here again. But it's originally, it's water. Um, that's what it was a picture of, the waves. But um, here it's the unilateral N. That's the mouth, R. Mm -hmm. The eye is um, not symmetrical, right? The, you have the, um, the iris is at one end, and it's bigger, and then it kind of tapers off uh, when you see it. I'm trying to think of. Um, is that one? No, let's see one. Yeah. Huh? That M has come down to us and just unchanged. Well, the M? Yeah. Oh, you mean this one or this one? That one. Oh, the, as an N, right? I guess as a yeah. I just cut it off, right? Uh, it's a good. Um, it's a good point. You know. Um, let me turn the lights back on. Um, it's thought probably, it's, it's speculated, it's hard to, okay, sorry, let me start over. Um, we don't have the firm evidence, but it is speculated that the alphabet used by the Phoenicians or the Proto-Canaanites was probably, was perhaps derived from Egyptian heretic, right? And that alphabet, of course, is eventually then taken by the Greeks, who add vowels. It's then taken by the Romans, right? And we use it today. So 
Again, it's, 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 it's a little bit hard to prove it on paper, but if you look, if you compare a proto Canaanite alphabet with the unilateral consonants in hieratic, it seems fairly plausible. And it would make sense because there was a ton of contact between um, the Eastern Mediterranean coast, you know, in, in Israel, Palestine, Lebanon, um, tons and tons of contact between them and Egypt in the late second millennium BC, right? It was actually part of the Egyptian empire. Um, and you have tons of Egyptian objects showing up in Lebanon and in, in Syria and in, in Israel and Palestine. And uh, so it's entirely plausible that it's happening that way. So if you want to, you can make an argument that our own alphabet is, you know, <laughs> by very long and winding path comes from, uh, comes from this. Yeah, yeah. You, we make this before he, he dies. Okay. You, you can't depend on people, right? So you've right. got to like, you got to make your own tomb before, <laughs> you know, you can't depend. Uh, you never know what they're going to do with the money. No. Um, uh, so, um, yes, yeah, so they would be, they would be paid craftsmen. You'd have probably different people who do different parts of it, uh, different sp specialties. People specialize, right? Um, and oftentimes, you know, the, probably, you know, the artists, you get a more talented artist who can do this is, again, like I was saying yesterday, there's a good chance these artists can't read um, what it actually says. And that's, there's lots of um, comparisons for that in other languages and other periods, right? That they're known, they're there for more for their artistic technique, not their scribal skills. Um, also, because I think it pays a lot more to be a scribe than a painter, so, you know. Um, oh, sorry, and what you mean that this guy, the snake? <laughs> you think uh, that you think that's him? That's him. It could be, <laughs> for sure. Um, right. Why did I put this one up here? Yes. Okay. Uh, two reasons. Of course, everyone's heard of the Book of the Dead, right? Yes. Um, so the Book of the Dead, as we, as we call it, it was not called the Book of the Dead um, back then. It was called Spells for Going Forth by Day. What does that mean? Um, it's, again, it's a later transformation of the coffin text. Now, in a kind of slightly changed form, of, you know, changing, it's because we're a few centuries later. Um, but there's still spells for transfiguration into the afterlife. And... Now what happens is that instead of um, a, your coffin, um, a lot of times, by the, at this point, the 18th, 19th dynasties, you would write the spells on papyrus, or papyrus roll. And you'd have your own personalized copy. So your name is inserted, of course, into all the spells in the appropriate place. Sorry. And also you would be illustrated in it, right? They're illustrated with vignettes. Here on the left, what we have is the kind of beginning part of the whole process. This is when, this is the deceased here. He's been mummified. Um, here is the priest who is going to do the opening of the mouth ceremony, which is when he's going to reanimate uh, the corpse, so to speak, so that it can breathe and exist in the afterlife. Um, and and it's a ritual involving incense and various things. So that's what's going on with these guys. Of course, you've got the mourners. Right, who are there to cry at the, um, about your death. Um, because even though they're obsessed about the afterlife, it's not because it's, they, they're so excited about it. Um, they feared death, right? They were deathly afraid of it. I mean, look, what, look at what the, you know, the uh, extent of effort they went to to make themselves feel about, better about dying, right? So, they, um, so the Egyptians had a great kind of concern and anxiety um, about death. And so there's still a lot of mourning, right, when, um, when people pass on. Uh, so that's what's illustrated there. This is his tomb um, and with a little kind of mini pyramid over it. This does happen in the New Kingdom. You start to get smaller, very small pyramids over tombs, even for everyday people. Uh, but the, uh, the big thing I wanted to show you, though, is that this is on a papyrus, and you have hieroglyphs, but now they're kind of cursive, right? You see how they're kind of they're smoother, right? Um, it's not hieratic. You can still see there's no ligatures. That's the, maybe the biggest difference between cursive hieroglyphs 
and hieratic is that, I mean, I guess cursive hieroglyphs is probably not even a really good term, but it's the term they use. Um, but they're more casual. They're not, they're, you know, they're, they're drawn, they're painted. Um, but there's no ligatures. Um, but this is very common for these types of texts um, that are on papyrus, that is to use the, the hieroglyphs. Sorry, where? Oh, the two lions. Um, so that's um, the symbol in the middle is the sun disk on the symbol for the horizon. So this is usually the, the so a horizon. Yeah. Um, so that's usually the symbol of the rising sun, Horakti, Hor, Horus, also equivalent, you know, made equivalent with the sun god, um, rising from the horizon. Um, Um, so the I mean, animals in general are closely connected to the gods. Um, the Egyptians believed that animals had a special relationship with the gods, uh, had their own powers, their own force of nature, um, and that then in certain lines or certain animals are often associated with with various gods. I'm trying to think, sort of a clear association with lions and the sun, maybe. Yes, half lion, um, half man. Yeah, exactly. Um, the Sphinx, yeah, originates as a lion. So maybe that's part of it. Also, obviously, it's an animal of power. Um, the four, the forearms of a lion um, are often used in words for authority, um, and uh, you know, for and for like titles so with people who are in charge of things, power. Um, so probably something along those lines. Mm, and supporting the, the disc, too. Mm -hmm. um. <laughs> right. Um, okay. That's not the only context. I'm going to turn the light off again because you can't see this very well. Um, not the only context that we get cursive hieroglyphs. Um, going back to royal tombs at this time, if we go to a 18th dynasty tomb, that of Tutmos III. These earlier New Kingdom tombs are not as lavishly decorated as some of the later ones that um, have, sorry, how many of you have been to the Valley of the Kings? Quite a few of you. How many of you have been to this tomb? Oh, only a couple of you. Well, if you return to Egypt, and for those of you who haven't, and you go to Egypt, you go to the Valley of the Kings, it's well worth checking out the tomb of Tutmos III. Um, it's a little farther off the path, but this room, the burial chamber, is quite special because of this um, type of um, decoration, and I think it's the only one with this decoration that's open to the public. And what's going on in this burial chamber is that there is a, a, a different underworld text, right? So the common man has taken over, right? not the common man, but right, you know, the non-royal have taken over the spells and everything. And, and kings still have their own spells for getting to the afterlife. But they also have, there's also these, um, these uh, underworld texts, which are these, I don't want to say just, I don't want to belittle them by saying they're just stories, but they are, because they have magical significance, but they are tales of basically, in this, in this particular case, they're a tale of the sun god's journey through the afterlife, and they're very metaphorical, right? So the sun god, of course, when the sun god goes, the sun goes below the horizon, right, at the end of the day, then makes a journey through the underworld and then rises the next day. And this happens over 12 hours or so they conceive of it. And the underworld's a very dangerous place, right? Um, so in doing this, the sun god has to battle all kinds of demons and forces that want to stop him because the gods are always battling the forces of chaos. This is how the Egyptians looked at the world, order and chaos, and that life is a constant battle against chaos. Um, the gods are doing it, the king is doing it with the gods, battling chaos, and then even individual people are helping um, you know, combat the forces of chaos through correct moral behavior. Um, so th what, this, uh, what we have here is I each vignette along, around the wall, it represents an hour of um, the afterlife and of, of the underworld, I should say, and, and his journey through it. And so at the end of the journey, once the sun god is successful, he is, of course, reborn again, right, as the rising sun. 
So the idea is that the king is going to go through this with the god, uh, and then he will too be reborn, but of course into the blessed part of the afterlife. Um, and this particular image that we're looking at on the left is from the fourth hour when the sun god ends up in the, what's called the snake land of Sokar. And it's a deserty area where the um, water, because he's been on this water channel, right, through the out underworld, and the water disappears. And the boat, because he travels by boat, right? It's Egypt, the Nile. You always travel by boat. Uh, he's traveling by boat, and his boat runs aground here. Or, well, I don't know if it, maybe it's depicted elsewhere. But anyways, his, his boat runs aground, and then they have to, his companions, his supporters, have to drag it um, through the sand and try and find the river again, which is, becomes meandering and um, zigzaggy, and, and the, way, the path becomes unclear, let's put it that way. And it, it's, it's all somewhat metaphorical. Um, I should also say, in the text we're told, it gets very dark um, at this point, in this location. It's very dark. Um, the life-giving water disappears. It's an unhappy place. And it's very, it has a, um, it's, there's a bit of psychological truth going on here, right? All these texts reflect, reflect psychological realities. Uh, you know, um, there's a number of obstacles for the sun god in this hour to combat and trying to find his way back to um, the river. And it's much like in life then, right? And the obstacles one encounters in life. The darkness is much like depression, right? It's the kind of the dark place people find themselves in. Um, at certain points in their life. And, you know, but there's also, the text tells us in this case that there's a lot of, that there's optimism uh, and that you, there's everything you need to succeed. It's there. You just have to find the strength to, you know, to use this stuff and get back on the right track. Um, but not alone, right? He's got helpers. He has helpers throughout the way um, who, who help him in, back into the right path. Um, so that's not a, I'm not really doing justice to this text, but it just gives you a sense of what's going on here. This isn't just, you know, it's not just all myths or, or whatever. There's a lot of depth and interesting stuff to these texts, uh, which makes them worth uh, reading and, and considering. What are those things that look like containers going down this You mean these? Yeah. This? Uh, oh, this. Yeah. I don't know what that is. Mm, so this is the river. This, that's a good question. I'm not sure. Yeah, I see that one up there. Um, I'm trying to think. Is it, it's not really not steps. It's maybe something from the side. Or is it, I don't know. Good question. Um, yeah, I'll try to find out. Um, but the style, again, which is the other major reason I wanted to mention this, is that we, again, we have these cursive hieroglyphs. It's all painted, right? And this is painted on a wall, but it's meant to look like a papyrus scroll. But instead, it's painted on the wall. Um, uh, and you know, I bring this up because a lot of times people say, oh, all Egyptian art looks the same. It's all the same, no matter what period, or this or that. And it's not really true. Um, you know, the style of this art here is quite different from some of the others. I mean, there's some, of course, consistencies in terms of how the figures are represented and so on, but you do get some changes. Um, so if you go to Egypt, go check out this room. It's, it's quite interesting. Um, okay, where are we on time? Am I probably running? Oh my gosh, I've talked so much. All right, we're not even going to get to the hieratic, but I'll leave the hieratic stuff on the slide so when I post them. Um, one more about hieroglyphs. Uh, Temple of Edfu, Temple of Horus at Edfu. This was um, constructed during the Greek um, during Greek rule, and as you probably figured out already, that even though the Greeks were in control, Egyptian religion continued on much as before. Egyptian traditions continued, the language continued, um, and temples continued, and temple building and hieroglyphs um, and so on. Uh, this is just, and of course, temples are another major context of where you find hieroglyphs. Uh, and the inscriptions cover all kinds of different topics, from you know rituals designed to maintain the appropriate relationship with the gods, which.